Jesus, and then the way we get refreshed is by refreshing other people. We want people to see Jesus when they see us. Amen. Our mission statement is to make disciples who understand their identity in God and ultimately, ultimately, excuse me, fulfill the Great Commission. What that means is that your identity in God is a son and a daughter of Abba Father. And when you truly understand that identity, it helps you carry the vision of the Father, which is to win the lost. And so you make disciples here that make disciples. They go out and get more. Amen. The 12 was selected and then they went and got 70 and then they got 120 and then, amen, and so on and so forth. Amen. So we believe in that here at the Church of Refreshing. And then now here's the core values. This is what we represent, okay? Our core values are as follows. Community. We believe in doing life with you. We don't believe in Sunday to Sunday Christianity. How many of you know that you need solid relationships, solid friendships, solid connections? Because it's hard out in the world today. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 that two is still better than one and a threefold cord is not easily broken. So we believe in establishing organic community by having good communication and a sense of unity. Amen. Next, what ties into that is our accountability system. We believe in holding everybody to the same standard. And when we are in a genuine community, it's easier to hold one another to that standard, which is the word of God. Amen. We believe in relatability. We don't believe in just preaching you a message, leaving you to deal with it. We believe in breaking the word down line upon line, precept upon precept, so it can be applicable to your everyday life. Amen. Amen. Because although the Bible was written thousands of years ago, it's still applicable today and will be applicable tomorrow. Somebody say yes. Amen. Uh, next, we have sound doctrine, which ties into my relatability aspect, because not every church is teaching and preaching the unadulterated, unfiltered word of God. But we don't believe in preaching and teaching our opinions. We believe in preaching the word as it is. Amen. Amen. Somebody say we bless God for sound doctrine. And last but not least, we believe in grace. Somebody say grace. We meet you where you are, help you not stay where you are, but we understand that people are human, so we don't charge your humanity against you from the leadership to the congregation. We believe that everybody has the right to grow in God, and we have grace for that. Amen. As we want you to have grace for us. Somebody give God praise if you love what we represent. Amen. Amen. The way you can remember it is by the acronym CARS G. CARS G. Community, accountability, relatability, sound doctrine, grace. All right. Who's ready for the word? Hallelujah. I always say I'm not going to be here long. So I'm going to stop saying that and see how fast I get out. <laughs> Y'all can laugh. It's okay. Amen. Malachi 3 verse 10 is where we're going to begin our text. If you'll just read that with me, New King James Version. Malachi 3 verse 10. You're good, Randy, until I read this and then we're out. Malachi 3 verse 10, New King James Version. I'm going to say this to all the visitors. The Lord spoke to me. Uh, a few weeks ago and told me that I was going to be talking about tithes and offering and giving um, in these weeks to come. And, and I woke up this morning a little nervous. I said, God, we got I know we got some new people coming in this day and I don't want them to think that we're a church that talks about money. But the Lord gave me confidence that obedience is better than sacrifice. Somebody say yes. And so what I want you to understand it is whenever God gives me a message, he gives me messages weeks, months in advance. It's not about who's coming because everybody that's coming needs what I'm about to say. Amen. And so in order to understand stewardship, which we talked about last week and understand who is Lord God or money, we have to deal with tithes and offering because we have to understand what God thinks and how he feels pertaining to our money in relation to his house and to him. Amen. Would you believe me if I told you that majority of Christians don't tithe, they just give offering because they don't understand the concept. And people are afraid to talk about it, which is why nobody grows. But I've learned from God that whatever you're afraid to deal with, whatever you're afraid to address is the area you will never have victory. So if you want to see a church that will prosper, you got to be able to talk to them about things like stewardship and money. Amen. Because millionaires don't get rich just from having a dollar and a dream. They get rich because they learn how to steward their wealth and they learn how to make the right investments. Somebody said they learn. Amen. So in this house, we learn. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 10, New King James Version says this. This is a commandment from the Lord. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Father, we ask you to give a blessing to the readers of your word preach and teach through me 
in Jesus mighty name all God's people say amen amen media team are we good on battery I want to make sure that there's no cutoffs if you need to switch do it now we're good amen let me know I'll go when they're ready as they're getting ready let me say this we're good okay praise God um the tithe. I'm going to try to break this down into two different parts because before we can talk about giving, we have to understand what, why do we even give to begin with. Amen. And so the, I broke this into two parts. And if I can do both at the same time, then I will. But if I can't, we'll just break it into two. So the title is tithes and offering part one, principle or law, principle or law. Amen. Okay. Um, First, we want to identify what is the definition of a tithe. Tithe literally just means 10%. Okay, it's the 10th. It's a 10th, so it's 10%. So in Malachi 3, verse 10, what God is saying is bring all the tenths of your income into the storehouse. The AMPC says it like this. It says, bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now by it, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Somebody say overflow. Okay, now we see the concept of overflow based on giving God what he asked for. Okay, so we see in the AMP, he says, bring all the tenth of your income. Now, I love this because he says the storehouse and God's house is a storehouse. That's what it's meant to be. When you think about storehouses, it's a safe place where things of value are kept safely. If you're tracking, say I'm tracking. Okay, the definition of safe house broken in the modern day would be like what we call a modern day safe. Things of value you put in a safe so that nothing happens to what's valuable. Anything that you hold dear, you put for safekeeping. Am I right? So the same thing dealing with money. Jesus even said it in the scriptures. In the gospel, he said, where your treasure is, there your Heart will be also because our heart, our emotions, our investment, our feelings, our energy is attached to what we hold dear. Am I making sense? And if we're honest in this room, everybody in this room has some sort of attachment to money. You don't need to amen, I know. Because we live in a place that is built on the consumer concept. And in a consumer concept, you spend money, you get something. You sell something, you get money. It's a concept that requires a transaction. Okay. Now, first thing we need to know is when did the tithe come about? A few months back, there was a debate, some some back and forth, some doctrinal differences on whether or not the tithe is relevant today. And believers, uh, even pastors begin to say stuff like, well, we're under the new covenant, so therefore tithing, since it's an old covenant concept, is no longer relevant today, so it's not required, it's voluntary. Was anybody aware of that? Can you raise your hand if you saw that on social media or remember that conversation? Okay, amen. Even had pastors begin to come under fire for tithe, uh, encouraging tithing, and people begin to say, you're operating under the law here, but in other areas like not eating pork and uh, wearing linen, you don't want to operate under the law. And some leaders were stumped. And the Bible says that we, as leaders, should study to show ourselves approved unto God, not to you. As workmen that needed not to be ashamed. So when someone comes with an assault against your doctrine, you ought to be so embedded in the gospel that you preach that you have an answer for their statements and their questions. Am I making sense? Which is why not everyone should be teachers because James 3, 1 says those that are teachers will be judged with a stricter judgment. Amen. And if you know me, then you know I'm big on doctrine. So what I want to do is instead of trying to get you to understand tithing, I want you to understand why we even tithe to begin with. Okay, so Genesis chapter 14, turn your Bibles there. Get ready to turn. Genesis chapter 14. In the amplified version, it's going to be on screen for you. Oh, it's there already. Amen. Genesis 14, verse 17 in the AMP. And we're going to start this text in verse 17 uh, dealing with a man named Abram. Most of y'all know him as Abraham. 
But before God changed his name, his name was Abram. Amen. And the Bible says in verse number 17, uh, there, what happened, to give context, there was some, uh, a scuffle, there was a battle that ensued where Abram went and he retrieved some people and he went and fought against some enemies. Amen. And the Bible says in verse number 17 where we find our text that after Abram's return from the defeat or the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Verse 18. Melchizedek, king of Salem, ancient Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine for them. He was the what? The priest of God who? Most high. So insert a man named Melchizedek who is a priest unto God. And the Bible says in verse number 19 that Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, blessed, joyful, favored be Abram by God most high, creator and possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed, praised, and glorified be God most high, who has given your enemies into your hand. So what we see is we see the priest of God blessing the man of God. We see the priest declaring a godly blessing on a man who follows after God. The statement he makes, Kennedy, is that he says, blessed be Abram. And the parenthesis says joyful and favored because the blessing of the Lord comes with favor. Somebody say favor. I'm here to explain to you that favor is something that can get you places that money cannot. Amen. And the joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. So what he really was saying was there is strength unto you and favor can take you places that money can't because God says so about you. The priest showed up and declared over the man of God, blessed be Abram by God most high. Creator and notice this word, possessor of heaven and earth. And then he says, and blessed, praised, and glorified be God most high, who has given your enemies into your hand. Watch what happens after the blessing. After the blessing is declared, prophetess beggar, Abram does something. The Bible says, Abram gave him, the priest, a tenth of all the treasure he had taken in battle. Somebody say he gave a tithe. Abram is blessed by God. He receives the blessing and then he turns around and he gives 10% of all the treasure that he just received. Why? Well, the concept comes from understanding that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. So, the fullness thereof includes my treasures. It's going to be quiet today because people don't like talking about money, but they love to pray about it. Amen. Y'all okay? I'm real like that. We pray about money, but don't want to talk about money. We want to raise, but we don't want to discuss tithe. We want a new job, but we don't discuss God's way. Why? Because we want to obtain things we don't understand. But when you gain understanding, you gain possession. Am I making sense? Okay. The earth is the Lord's. The fullness thereof. The world. And they that dwell therein. So Abram says, because the priest reminded him that he is blessed by God. And then he reminds him that God is the possessor of heaven and earth. He says, I might as well give God what he's due. Am I making sense? He gives God a tenth because the treasure God gave to him belonged to God. The preceding statement was, blessed, praised, and glorified be God most high who has given your enemies into your hand. Watch this. And Abram gave him a tenth of all the treasure he had taken in battle. Notice God gave something. Abram took something. So he gave God back something. Am I making sense? When God gives you something, he's giving you something to see how you're going to steward what he entrusted to you. Do y'all remember last week? Somebody say stewardship. Okay. What happens here? Genesis is where we find the beginning of the Bible. 
Exodus is where we identify Moses, a deliverer. In the book of Exodus, something appears. Somebody say the law. The book of Exodus introduces to us the law. 613 rules given by God to a man named Moses for God's people, Israel. He gave him 613 rules for the people to follow. But Abram comes before Moses. The tithe was implemented further in the law. Leviticus talks about it. But then we see Abram in Genesis giving a tithe where there is no law. So the concept of old covenant versus new covenant gets dismantled here. Because tithing is not a mosaic law, it's a kingdom commandment. Moses says, give God your tithe. Abram just gave God a tithe because his posture was already aligned with God. Tithing is not about commandment or law. It's about posture. What you give says a lot about where you are in your heart. Am I making sense? Let's go further. In Hebrews chapter 7, we're going to see Melchizedek's name again. Are y'all bored already? Okay, good. You know, because I could talk about a bunch of stuff like your haters and, um, you know, followers on socials and God's about to prepare a table in front of your enemies and they're going to have to watch you eat it in their face. I could say all that stuff that gets people anticipated and hype and, ooh, adrenaline. But when you walk away, you'll see like thousands of those reposts on social media. So did I really pastor you or did I just amp you up? Here we want to learn. Somebody say we want to learn. Amen. Because what we learn, we can obtain. Amen. Hebrews chapter 7, if you're there, say amen. Verse number 1, King James Version says, For this Melchizedek, let me give context. Would y'all like context? Okay, context. In chapter 6, we see uh, verse number 20. I'm going to just read uh, chapter 6, verse number 20. It says, Whither the forerunner is for us enter. I know I'm reading King James, but y'all got to stay with me. What they're saying is, where the forerunner has gone, he's entered. Even Jesus, Jesus is the forerunner, may, excuse me, and a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What is he saying? He's saying that Jesus, excuse me, when he entered back into heaven, became a high priest in the same fashion as Melchizedek already was. Are y'all following what I'm about to say? What I'm about to say. Jesus was made a high priest in heaven like Melchizedek already was. Stay with me. Somebody say I'm tracking. So chapter 7, verse 1, the story continues. You got to read it like that. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, where did we see Melchizedek? Genesis. Now we're in the New Testament. Where is that? Hebrews. Are we under the Old Covenant now? No. Hebrews is written under what covenant? Y'all tracking? For this Melchizedek, the one that they're making a comparison to Christ about, king of Salem, priest of the most high God who met Abraham returning from the start of the kings and blessed him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all first being by interpretation pay attention king of righteousness and after that also king of Salem which is king of peace do y'all notice some capital letters in there where are they King, king, wait a minute, king. I only know one king with a capital K. No? The king of kings name is Jesus. No? The king of Salem is the king of peace. Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. But the Bible says there's no one righteous but God. Does the Bible contradict itself? Absolutely not. How are you reading it? If God is saying that there's no man good but God and righteousness does not come except through God, let's break it down. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that Christ 
was made to be sin, who knew no sin, that we through him might be made the righteousness of God. But the only way we could become righteousness was through Christ. Hmm. Now we see a man who shows up in the Old Testament as a priest of the Most High God, but there were no priests at any point up until this point. The order of the priesthood didn't show up again until Exodus. Yet we see a, a order of things reveal itself out of the blue in Genesis. Who is this man who just shows up after his man defeats people in the name of the Lord and then declares out of his mouth that this man is blessed by God? Who are you to speak for God? But then the writers in the new covenant thought it so fitting to bring his name back up in relevancy with Jesus Christ being made high priest after crucifixion and resurrection. Are y'all still with me? Do any of y'all like deep stuff? This is that. Melchizedek shows up in Genesis. Hebrews brings him back up. In Hebrews 7, and then says, without father, verse 3, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. Abideth, meaning liveth, a priest continually. How you don't have a birthday nor an end date, but you're still here. Hold on, wait a minute. Let me take my glasses off. I only know one man who lives forever. And when men die in him, their spirit lives forever. You're not saying nothing to me. I said, I only know one man who died and came back to life and still is alive. Amen. Okay, we got amen. Prophet is going to shoot it down. We're going to run it down. Amen, right here. Prophetess, this man is being written about in the same sentence with Jesus. But all through scripture, the only time I see someone, hey beautiful, mentioned in the same sentence with Jesus was when someone was talking about Jesus and the Father. No men are mentioned in the same context with Jesus unless they were a symbol of Jesus. No, the Bible says that God told the children of Israel, I'm going to raise up a prophet unto you like Moses. In Acts, Stephen reiterates that statement and said, did God not raise up a prophet unto you like Moses and you didn't receive him, but his name was Jesus? Lord have mercy. I'm trying my best. Okay. Uh, amen. Um, then I see them say, <laughs> Then I see them say that David would have someone from his lineage, thank you, beautiful, who would carry his royal kingship into the ages because of God's covenant with him. And the man who showed up in the house of David under a pure virgin was Jesus. So Hebrews 7 shows us a thing that's be bewildering. How can you mention a man if he's merely immortal in the same breath with our Savior? What's different about this guy? Let's pay attention to it. It says he doesn't have a beginning and he doesn't have an end. Somebody say he's eternal. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father except through me. Are you a high priest of the most high God and you didn't go through Jesus? Unless you are Jesus. Y'all still awake? Why is the writer putting emphasis on this man? Let's pay attention. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tip of the spoils. In other words, Abraham is the godfather of our faith as we know it. Yet this man was greater than him that Abraham had to give him his resources. He gave him his tithe. He, this, he shows up out of nowhere, but Abraham recognizes something about him to give him something. Verse number five. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the what? 
the law. That is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. In other words, these guys showed up later. The only people that could be priests was people who were born from the house of Levi. But the Bible says Melchizedek had no genealogy, so he's not from Levi's descendants. Huh. Then it says, but he whose descent is not counted from them, wait a minute, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Huh. Verse 8, and here, somebody say here. Where is here? On earth. Here, Tyler, men die. Men that die receive tithes, meaning mortal men receive tithes. Y'all catch what I'm saying? Mortal men receive tithes, Alexis. But there, he, who is he? Melchizedek, receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me this guy existed over 2,000 plus years ago? More than that because Jesus was 2,000 or 2,000. So probably 3,000, 4,000, how many? A thousand years ago, he's not dead. And you mean to tell me that in heaven, when men down here receive the tithe, in heaven, he takes the tithe for heaven. More proof that this can't be a covenant old thing because it, it can't be an old covenant if the old covenant was fulfilled. The old covenant is fulfilled. So now the new covenant shows up and yet this man is still receiving tithes. Are you tracking? Amen. I don't know. Are y'all tracking? Okay. So what am I saying? I'm saying when you give tithes and offering on earth, heaven actually receives it up there. Because you're not sowing into a ballpark. Thank you, beautiful. She wants me to highlight. You're not sowing into a ball game. You're not sowing into a Mary J. Blige concert. You're not listening. You're not sowing into your car insurance. You're not sowing into your car note. The only thing you sow in that heaven receives is your tithe and your offering. Hear me, hear me. Heaven takes your 10% and presents it before most high God. What am I saying? I'm saying that the reason why the devil doesn't want people to understand the concept of paying tithes is because he doesn't want you to receive the blessings that have been stored up for you in heaven when you obey the kingdom principle. It's not about laws, it's about covenant. The reason why God was able to make a covenant with a man named Abraham is because Abraham didn't value money more than he valued his relationship with God. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Abraham did not value his wife and his livestock and his victories and his military prowess more than he valued his relationship with God. So God did not, can I say something to you? God didn't enter into covenant with Abraham until after he showed himself worthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Notice, God said, blessed is Abram in Genesis 14. But Genesis 12 is where Abram first was called. We don't see a blessing show up till two chapters later. Why is that? Because the first thing that God required from Abram was radical obedience. Can I teach the way I need to teach? Abram was a man who already had wealth. But God said, I want you to give up this wealth and learn how to trust me to give you your own wealth, not your daddy's wealth. I got time. Because if it hadn't been connected only to his daddy, then we would have not been able to be connected to him. Can I speak to you? You ask God, why is God choosing me to be the odd man out? Because maybe God want to do a new thing through you. And your lineage is not worthy of being the person he do that through unless somebody steps out and does something new. Am I making sense? Because God established his covenant with people who prove themselves worthy. Somebody say amen. Okay. I know you thought we were going to talk about just money. No, we're talking about covenant. So heaven receives the tithe. Now, question is, why do we give tithes? Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 9, AMPC. It's AMP? That's what you got? Okay. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. It's God speaking. He's talking to the prophet Malachi. What is he saying? He's saying, will men rob me? And they's like, no, Lord, we wouldn't rob you. And what does God say? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? How can you rob God? I'm going to tell you. In tithes and offerings, you have withheld. 
Can I talk now? We've been so focused on the 10% that we forget withholding an offer from God still goes against his commandment. My offering is voluntary. Everything you do is voluntary, but every commandment from God is not a suggestion. When you give God a tithe but don't give God an offering, you still robbed him. I said it ain't that deep. Well, you know, it wouldn't be if I wrote it. But he wrote it. So again, the tithes and offering that you withheld, you mean to tell me that God, possessor of all heaven and earth, feels slighted when you don't do what he asks of you? Look what he says. You are cursed with the curse, for you are robbing me, this whole nation. Can I speak really quickly? Let me prophesy to you. Be mindful about who you sow into in these coming days because some people are going through it, not because they're going through it, but because they robbed God. Now they're under a curse. And if you sow into their curse, you'll be cursed. I'm very mindful about who I give money to because when I sow into you, I'm saying that I'm willing to invest into the ground that you are. And not all soil is good soil. Amen. You keep it, baby. You keep it. The cheese to eat it. I love you. Amen. You see how my daughter is ready to give to her father? That's what tithes and offering from a son looks like. We don't worry about giving money to God because we know our daddy got more where that came from. She's willing to give me a cheese it because I bought the cheeses. I got time. She's willing to give me a mini bites because I bought the bites. Amen. I'm the one footing the grocery bill. So she don't mind giving me something because she know where it came from. Glory to God. Somebody say God is in charge. That's right. So God was saying he cursed the people because a whole nation, because they were withholding his tithe and his offering. Look at verse 10. So then after he said that, he said, bring all the tithes. In other words, you've been withholding, but I'm going to give you a fresh chance. Bring the tenth of your income into my house so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you. I'm an a huh? That's fine. So great a blessing until there is no more room to receive it. Somebody say, bring all the tithes. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. I learned something in grammar, in English. Dr. Cheryl, you in uh, education. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, when you see something say a verb, but there's no noun in front of it, you put the noun there, don't you? Amen. So when God said bring, you just put your name in there. Can we use education system? When you see the word bring or do or obey or do not, put your name in front of it so you'll understand it's not a suggestion. It's a commandment to us. So when he said, bring all the tithes, he knew where this was going to go thousands of years later. But Piper, he wrote it like that. So everybody who reads it won't think that this applies to everybody else except them. Oh, this ain't about Israel. This is about the believer. Can I talk? Because he said, bring all the tithes into my house. Meaning that people who aren't people of God, the, even though this rule applied to them, they don't get the same response from God concerning it because they are not in his house. So it don't apply to them. Am I making sense? Amen. If I pay a $30 fee at LA Fitness, but I don't go to LA Fitness, I'm not a member, they won't even take my money. They'll take it, but I won't get anything from it. I'm sorry, I'm going to wait a second and let that kick in for you. Unbelievers even try to pay their tithe. And God has to honor his word because he's not a man that he shall lie. Whatever a man sows, but if they withhold their tithe, he don't hold it against them because they are not committed anyway. Oh, God, Jen, I got time. If I go to the gym and I'm not a member of that gym and I pay them $20, they'll take my money if I insist. But they won't give me anything in return. And if I don't pay, they won't penalize me. But if I'm a member and I signed the contract and I said I'm signing up for this gym and I want to work out and I want to receive everything that come with this gym. If I don't pay, they call my phone so fast. Mr. Baker, so do Mr. Baker. We saw that your payment didn't go through. Would you like us to try another card? They don't care if you haven't been to the gym in three months. They still want their payment because you said you signed up to be a member. So they're holding you to your word. I got time. You, I don't got time. Many times what we do is, well, God, you know, uh, you know, things ain't been working out the way they need to be. So this week, I'm going to get you back. 
The Bible don't say pay your tithe when it's convenient. It say bring your tithe. Let, let me use me as an example. I'll never forget the time that I decided to skip paying my tithes to God. So conveniently, that week was the week that my credit card information got hacked. And I said, God, why? He said, I'm going to get you back next week. See, that's how God talked to me. I don't know what, you know. But I was like, whoa. He reminded me of what I said. And I said, dang, he got me. And the Lord showed me, I didn't get you. The minute you didn't pay your tithe and op- oh, oh, can I say this later? Uphold your commitment. You open the door to the devourer. I didn't have to do nothing. I'm going to teach you something. Many people are mad at God about things they did. But when you open the door to the thief, you can't get mad if he steal from you. I'm talking. Because whenever you don't obey God, you're saying, devil, you have legal access to to my money, legal access to my health, legal access to my mind, legal access to my kids, legal access to my marriage, because I'm not following through with what you told me to do. Bring the mistress back. We about to go. Huh? I tell you, I'm going to be before you long. I got to give you the gems and go. Notice, it's a commandment because it's a kingdom principle. Notice this, all through the Bible, God said this, I'm the God, people said it like this, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is how God said it, right? Put that on screen for them. Acts 7, 32. Look at this. Y'all got it? Amen. Look at this. God would say, I'm the God of your fathers. Somebody say your fathers. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Wait a minute. All through scripture, we see that statement. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. What's he saying? I'm consistent with the generations. I don't change. I'm his father and his father and his father and their father and your father. And the, you don't understand what I'm saying. And so now we're looking at the scripture and we're saying, God is saying, if I did it to them and told them what they should do, you are not exempt from the commandment. Lord, have mercy. Can I say this to you? He the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, Abraham paid his tithe. Okay, Pastor, I'm going to need another reference from the Old Testament for me to believe that God really wanted us to do that before the law came in. I got you. Genesis 28. <laughs> Somebody say, all the way to the back. Now nah, y'all don't want to talk to me. All the way to the back. He got Bible for ya. <laughs> Genesis 28 verse 20 through 22 watch this then Jacob made somebody say Jacob made this vow if God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey and if he will provide me with food and clothing and if I return safely to my father's home then the Lord will certainly be my God he like most of the saints if God do something I'll do something the opportunist saint God if you do this I promise after this I'll never do this again Maybe me call y'all out now. Y'all, I'll tell you, raise your hand. The whole building be standing up. God, now if you do this, I know, you, I know what you said. Listen, 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 listen. But look, I just need this one more thing. After that, I'm done. That's what Jacob did, right? I said, it's in our lineage. You can't help it. Jacob did it. <laughs> and this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God. And I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. Read your Bible. Couple chapters later, God brought him back safe. Jacob was paying tithes. Wait a minute. Abraham, Abraham's grandson is paying the tithe and there still ain't no law here. Somebody say kingdom principle. Let's make it make sense. If he's the God of our ancestors and our ancestors paid their tithes, you know. Uh-huh. And we're blessed by their obedience, then we should pay our tithes too. Amen. Let's go further. Matthew 23, verse 23. Some of people like evangelists, these are the people I love. I don't believe it. That's the words in red say it. Somebody say, he got Bible for you. They're going to hashtag that after church. Amen. This is in red. They didn't color it, but you look in your Bible, you'll see it. Amen. Well, look at what Jesus says. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. Somebody say hypocrites. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Piper, say it with me, Pipe. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the most, the more important thing. These days, we want to 
pay attention to justice, mercy, and truth, but don't want to pay our tithe. This generation got the, the, the opposite effect. Somebody say the opposite. We like, be kind, be compassionate, be gentle, but save your money. Uh, listen, 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 listen. You know, we under the new covenant, so the Bible say God love a cheer, forgive us. So if you really don't feel it in your heart to give, you ain't got to give. What kind of doctrine is this? Wh who taught you? I'm so sorry because God's character doesn't change. And if you look in the scripture, can I jump off in my revelation bag? Get Randy, you know, I sent you earlier. We might get ready to crank that up. Let me show you something. If we jump in my revelation bag, let me show you something I discovered, Khalil. I'm looking at my son, Khalil, because you know we like those deep things in God. One thing that I've discovered about God is that when you look at the 613 laws of Moses, there are some of those laws that did not disappear. And you can't identify every law that didn't disappear, but you know it by the spirit. And the reason and you know about the spirit is because the spirit of God is the character of God and the character of God does not change so every law that exemplifies the character of God did not get eradicated in other words if it were not so then the Ten Commandments would have left but Jeremiah chapter 31 that's right evangelist says that he'll put his law in your mind and write it upon the tablets of your heart why because when you're really connected you already know what he want from you you don't got to guess so you don't need me to tell you that a law about incest didn't get eradicated because in your spirit, you know, incest is not of God. Hello. Y'all don't want to talk. Uh, Pastor DeMarco, come on. Uh -uh. You got to get to the place where you stop trying to find loopholes around what God said based on the convenience that you are trying to carry. And remember that God will never change. So why would his character change? Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. Somebody say you should tie. Now that's words in red. Timer wise, where am I at? Can somebody give me how many minutes, please? Really quick. Huh? Amen. No, how much I've been up here? Give me time. Real quick, real quick. I need to do this, please. How many? Amen. We're about to close right here. I was at my last point. No lie. Okay. Can I say something to you? I could... I'm going to say this like this. Mm. Somebody say posture. I'm being led by the Spirit in this moment. Everything I said to you, some of you was like, that's a good message but you don't feel like it's stinging, it's pinging nothing for you. But the Holy Spirit is gonna have me speak to you right here. It's for every last one of you in your heart. It's like, that was, that was good. But what's this gonna do with my life? Let me show you something. If you still think at the end of this message that I was talking about money, you weren't listening. Because I wasn't talking about money. I was talking about posture. I was talking about your commitment to the one you call Father. That's what I was talking about. I wasn't talking about paying something to the house of God. I was talking about giving God what's already his. I was talking about realizing that God doesn't change, so your commitment to him shouldn't either. I was talking about understanding that you can't pray for something that you have not invested in spiritually. I was talking about how Jesus is revealed in the old covenant just like he showed up in the new. I was talking about how Jesus revealed himself through a man named Melchizedek just like he revealed himself through the angel of the Lord that took the Egyptians an army and he drowned them and took Israel out of Egypt. I was talking about how the angel of the Lord, also Jesus, capital A, showed up in Joshua when he showed up to tell Joshua when he said, I'm taking you into this land. And Joshua asked him, whose side are you on? And Jesus responded, neither. I am the commander of the Lord's army. I was talking about the one who revealed himself from Genesis to Revelation as God and will forever be God. So when God asks us something as simple as a tithe, if we can't give God a tithe, we got way bigger fish to fry. That's what I was talking about. Because your posture will be reflected based on what you're able to obey when it's convenient versus when it's not. Am I making sense? One thing the Holy Spirit has taught me is that many times messages go over people's head because they don't feel it's relevant to their life. But show me where obedience is not relevant to your walk. 
Last week, I talked about stewardship. For all the visitors, I'll catch you up. Quick summary. Last week, I talked about stewardship. And in that message, I explained that to obey God is better than to sacrifice to God. I explained last week that when God entrusts things to you, he's already seen what you're capable of. And he trusts that you're going to be able to fulfill your potential, but only in him. In that stewardship message, I made it very clear that whatever God gives you, the more he gives, the more he requires of you. The less you receive, the less he requires. But based on what you steward with a little bit would determine if God actually releases more to you. I told you three weeks ago to date, was it three? Four, actually. Over the next few weeks, if you receive the messages that I'm going to release to you, that your finances will change. If you can raise your hand, if any of you have seen a difference in your finances. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It works. Twelve. We're not preaching a dead gospel. We're not preaching a dead gospel. God is still showing his power. But the key is, will you apply yourself long enough to see the fruit of what you're sowing into? When you make commitments to God, you can't be quick to pull out just because it didn't show up right away. Walking with God is not the stock market. It's not going to crash on you. You don't have to be afraid and pull everything out because you're afraid that everything you invested is going to go down the drain. That's not how it works. His word says in Galatians chapter 6 verse 9, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Meaning if he lets his word fall to the ground, then he's making a mockery of himself. So be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, meaning whatever he says out of his mouth, he'll reap that. Whatever he sows in the church, he'll reap that. Whatever he gives voluntarily, he'll reap that. If he stewards his possessions right, he'll reap that. If he doesn't gossip about, about people, he'll reap that. Whatever he sows, that's what he's going to reap. Because God is the ultimate covenant keeper. So when I bring a topic like a tithe to you, your response to it just tells me where you are spiritually. Because I told you before, money is the smallest element that we could ever talk about. Because the Bible says that God owns everything. So what is a dollar to God? I told you before, God walks on dust, uh, gold like it's dust under his feet. You think he worried about money? He's not. But let me explain something I've learned about God, Minister Tyler. God deals with men where they are even though he's calling them to where they should be evangelists. So God says, can you be faithful to tithe even when your check was short? Now I'm in the prophetic. Can you be faithful to give an offering even if it's the last dollar you had, knowing that that last dollar wasn't going to do nothing for the bills anyway, so just give it to God and see, prove him if he won't do something with what you gave from your last. You're talking to a man who was giving God everything in my bank account when I was at the bottom of it. And watch God turn it around the next day and give me thousands of dollars the next day. I'm telling you, God is not concerned about rent, power, water, car insurance, car notes, job promotions, or none of that. But he cares about it because you care about it. So if you'll just obey him, everything you need will be supplied. I don't preach a prosperity gospel. I preach the gospel. And the gospel includes prosperity because it says that no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly, not dip their toe in righteousness, not one step in righteousness, not crawl in righteousness. No, they've made a decision. When you begin walking, you know where you're going. Can I talk to somebody in here? Some of you in here, you came to this church for the first time and the Lord is calling your number today to see if you'll be willing to be committed to what you've already promised him from years oh my god i hear the lord he said years prior life got the best of you but don't let it get anymore i'm speaking prophetically the lord says today is the day if you hear his voice don't harden your heart because this ain't about money this is about posture the lord says everything that i've asked of you i haven't asked because you're not capable i've asked because you are capable the Lord says, everything that I've required of you, I've required because you're more than able to perform what I've called over your life. The Lord says, obedience to me is more important than what you can sacrifice. God says, you can keep the fast, you must obey. God says, the seed is good, but I just want you to obey. The Lord says, today is the day. Today is the day.
Somebody say today is the 